last week's major explosion, the tension between Israel and Lebanon has escalated to the brink of war. Both countries have been engaging in missile exchange this whole week, causing more than 600 deaths in Lebanon and more than 90,000 people there have been newly displaced, adding to the 110,000 who had fled their homes before the escalation, according to the United Nations. Meanwhile, the United States, United Kingdom and other EU allies, along with the UNGA, have asked for a 21 day diplomatic ceasefire. Israel, however, has rejected the global call for a ceasefire and has asked its soldiers to prepare for a ground invasion. Thailand has become the first Southeast Asian country to recognize same-sex marriage. The bill cleared the Senate in June but required royal endorsement to become law. It was published in the Royal Gazette on Tuesday and will come into effect on the 22nd of January next year. Activists hailed the move as historic. It masks the culmination of years of campaigning for marriage equality. Prime Minister Pei Tong Tan Shinawatra posted on X, Congratulations on everyone's love. Hashtag love wins. Thailand has long been seen as a relative haven for the LGBTQ plus community in a region where such attitudes are rare. American actor Meryl Streep raised her voice in UNGA to highlight the plight and suffering of Afghan women under the Taliban. The actor has said that a squirrel has more rights than an Afghan girl under the current Taliban regime and called the Taliban's draconian restriction on women's lives a form of suffocation. And today, in Kabul, a female cat has more freedoms than a woman, a squirrel has more rights than a girl in Afghanistan today because the public parks have been closed to women and girls by the Taliban. A bird may sing in Kabul, but a girl may not, and a woman may not in public. This is extraordinary. This is a suppression of the natural law. The Taliban, since they've issued over 100 edicts in Afghanistan, stripping women and girls of their education and employment, their freedom of, of expression and movement, they have effectively incarcerated half, half their population. In the three years since the Taliban took control of Afghanistan, women have seen their rights and freedoms systematically stripped away. They have been barred from most forms of paid employment, prevented from walking in public parks, and girls have been stopped from going to secondary school or university recently. They have been barred from singing or even looking at men in public whom they are not related to. On the whole issue of Afghan women and their plight, we at Strat News Global and Global Compass had done an interview with Dr. Raghav Sharma, Director of Afghan Studies at OP Jindal University, who provided a deep dive into the complex and deteriorating situation of women in Afghanistan. The link is in the description of this video too. Do watch that interview and write in your comments to us. Sri Lanka appoints its first Marxist-leaning president, Anura Kumara Disanayake. Within the first week of his appointment, the Sanayake, commonly referred to by his initials AKD, started to implement his party's poll promises after coming to power. He approved the reintroduction of the old visa system and also hinted at the introduction of pro-poor policies in the coming days. The Sanayake has also directed the allocation of luxury vehicles used by the government authorities for essential services. Coming from an anti-India and pro-China alliance, the new president has maintained his democratic stance on continuing a healthy relationship with India. Shigeru Ishiba won the race to become Japan's next prime minister on Friday. He will now succeed Japan's current premier, Fumio Kishida, as the leader of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party, or LDP, and the nation's next prime minister. The elections on Friday saw a close fight between Shigeru Ishiba and hardline nationalist Sene Takiachi in a runoff vote. It was seen as one of the most unpredictable leadership elections in decades, with a record nine candidates in fray. Hello. You're with me on Global Compass, the weekly show that updates you on all that has been happening around the world. In our next segment, let's take a look at some of the stories that were specifically featured on Strat News Global. 
Australia, New Zealand and Japan's naval ships were spotted in Taiwan Strait earlier this week, putting China on its toes. Japan has sent a destroyer JS Sazanami through the Taiwan Strait for the first time amid increasing military activity around Japan by China. Japan's government has declined to comment on the ship, citing military operation discretion. But China on Thursday confirmed its military had responded to the activities of a Japanese self-defense force ship entering the Taiwan Strait. China is highly vigilant about the political intentions of Japan's actions and has lodged stern representations with Japan, Foreign Ministry spokesman Lian Chiang said. Pulitzer Prize-winning author Jhum Pallahiri declined to accept an award from New York City's Noguchi Museum after it fired three employees for wearing kefir headscarves, an emblem of Palestinian solidarity, following an updated dress code. Across the world, protesters demanding an end to Israel's war in Gaza have worn the black and white kefir headscarf, a symbol of Palestinian self-determination. Pfizer has rolled out a plan to make its medicines available to the world's poorest nations at not-for-profit prices just over two years after it launched. The program, which Pfizer called an accord for a healthier world, launched in 2022 and was expanded to cover more products in 2023. It aims to provide 45 low-income countries affordable access to Pfizer's entire portfolio of drugs and vaccines, including bestsellers like blood thinner Eliquis and cancer drug Ibrance, as well as new products. Interestingly, earlier this year, the company was criticised for its rollout of its COVID-19 vaccine, with some poorer countries waiting for months compared to wealthier ones. The Kremlin announced on Thursday that adjustments to Russia's nuclear weapons doctrine, as outlined by President Vladimir Putin, should be viewed as a clear warning to Western nations. Putin had stated that Russia could resort to nuclear weapons if struck by conventional missiles, emphasizing that any attack on Russia supported by nuclear power would be considered a joint assault. The changes to Russia's nuclear doctrine came in response to discussions in the United States and the United Kingdom about whether to permit Ukraine to use conventional Western missiles against Russia. According to Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov, these adjustments will send a definite signal to the West about the consequences of their participation in any attack on Russia, even if the attack does not involve nuclear weapons. Ahead of the 2024 US presidential election, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi attended the Quad meeting in Wilmington in the United States. In his trip, he attended the Quad Leaders Summit on September 21st, addressed thousands of members of the Indian American community in Long Island on September 22nd, and spoke at UN Summit of the Future on the 23rd. Prime Minister Modi engaged in bilateral discussions with world leaders and held a roundtable with CEOs from leading American tech companies. Emphasizing upon ongoing global conflicts, Prime Minister Modi highlighted that Quad is not against anyone but supports a rules-based international order, respect for sovereignty and peaceful resolution of disputes. Notably, the Quad leaders also announced the Quad Cancer Moonshot, a partnership aimed at initially combating cervical cancer in the Indo-Pacific with plans to address other types of cancer in the future. So Quad leaders highlighted global concerns regarding cancer. You might be aware that cancer is the second leading cause of death globally. It accounted for an estimated 9.6 million deaths or 1 in 6 deaths in 2018. Lung, prostate, colorectal, stomach and liver cancer are the most common types of cancer in men, while breast, colorectal, lung, cervical and thyroid cancer are most common among women. So what can we do to address the challenges of detection and treatment of cancer? I met Mr. Vivek Vadva, a renowned Indian-American technology entrepreneur and academic who has been working on a long-shot project to detect cancer in people easily and without burning a hole in one's pocket. His company, called Vionics Biosciences, is now partnering with IIT Madras and New Delhi's All India Institute of Medical Sciences ecotoxicology team to tide over the challenges of onerous costs and procedures to conduct tests. Its goal of collecting health information in a less invasive way has long been a dream of medical technologists. Listen to this excerpt from the interview when I sat down with Mr. Vadva at AIMS. 
you are aware of the the load of disease the load of uh, you know illness uh, that we have if we were specifically to talk about india also the amount of poverty the amount of waterborne diseases you know uh, diarrhea measles dengue uh, malaria year after year and not to mention cancer cancer is uh, one of the leading killers uh, of you know all over the world so how did you start this journey in india not only is cancer taboo people cannot afford to get tested for cancer that's right in, in the united states for example you can get uh, genetic sequencing which costs about $1000 and then you can get these grail tests which cost again at $1000 $1000 is nothing in america for uh, you know for for getting medical treatments in india you know very 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 few people can afford it so the suffering is immense so i started looking into uh, why you know uh, we we why there hasn't been any revolution in medical diagnostics for the past 50 years the you know even thoroughness You remember Theranos, the fraud, 1.4 billion dollar fraud. They were supposed to revolutionize medical diagnostics, but it was more of the same. It was essentially immunoassays, as they're called, where you take a drop of blood, you take a blood, you know, Theranos had one drop of blood, yeah. break it into little buckets, and then you test it with different reagents. Right. That's the state of the art. And then you have mass spectrometry, very advanced equipment in which you ionize a sample, measure mass to charge ratios. and then you have genetic sequencing there's no other breakthrough so i started looking into that and i realized that um, the fact that i didn't know anything about medical diagnostics gave me an advantage because i wasn't burdened by the techniques of the past so in how many years will an indian woman be able to get herself screened for cancer okay, so my cervical cancer breast cancer i mean uh, right now the 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 goals are more tactical uh, at in you know we're at the center of clinical excessive toxicology at aims there's a uh, pandemic across india of metal poisoning what's happening is that as industry moves into small towns and villages they're polluting the environment as climate change happens uh, all sorts of new minerals are going into the, and into the environment into the water supplies and the tests required for things like cadmium and god knows what other you know metals and so on they are either unavailable or extremely expensive not available so this is a problem that they have here at aims so i'm going to solve that problem first my goal is within the next 6 months to have a device here by which they can do what uh, you know do the same things they do with their advanced medical equipment in detecting uh, metal poisoning in urine also in breath and then So my goal is to have a device here by which they can start doing uh, screening for metal poisoning and then in 2025 also did, uh, some of the other common diseases in India such as tuberculosis that's what I want to do. Cancer is my ultimate goal but for that you need to do uh, blood and we need a lot more technology development than the low hanging fruit which is you know metal poisoning and volatile organic compound detection this that's my 2025 goal. Uh, are you not worried are you not worried about how the big pharma companies or how the other companies in are in india i've met uh, the prime minister twice uh, um, modi has told me that he will do everything you know he said the country will do everything they can to support me okay so he's pledged his support All right. and then i have and uh, then uh, ajay so the principal scientific advisor rajesh gokhale sector biotech they've been going out of the way to help me okay so i'm not worried about india stopping me because india has no industry to protect it's back home i hope the americans don't disown me You can watch the entire interview exclusively on Strat News Global on Tuesday. Please write in your comments. Don't forget to like and share this video so that more and more people are aware of such efforts. I do hope you have subscribed to this channel and have made sure that your friends and family who are interested in foreign affairs have done so as well. And it's time to wrap up this week's Global Compass, but before we let you go, here is a glimpse of mariachi artists who gathered to celebrate one of their most iconic cultural expressions with a mariachi marathon in downtown Mexico City. Mariachi lovers sang along with the artists to some of the most renowned songs of this music genre, carrying umbrellas to protect themselves from the sun. In 2011, UNESCO added mariachi music to its intangible cultural heritage list. Here are a few glimpses from that performance. I will see you next week. Till then, take care.